I'm slightly different from the other speakers. I think all the other speakers have had a PowerPoint presentation. I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, all have thanked Dinesh. I will blame Dinesh for inflicting this on me. I thought I was done on the first day. Uh, uh, yeah. So I'll not also take too, too, too long on this. Uh, I think Dinesh wanted me to speak a little bit on the system of rice intensification as a grassroots innovation. Uh, and I'll come to it a bit indirectly. I'd like to start with some you know, personal dilemmas in terms of being somewhere between the activist academic kind of space. Uh, so my own interaction with the literature or the theory of innovation has been intermittent and with a deep sense of discomfort with uh, you know, what is happening. I don't have an answer and I'd like to share some of the confusions that uh, I have in mind. Uh, first, I'll give it through three instances that uh, I would like to basically argue that most of us need to be looking at more grounded theory on innovation. Uh, let me give you an example. When we had started work, when I was in Hyderabad about six, seven years back, uh, and an innovation policy analyst, as my definition then was, we were trying to take the innovation systems framework and apply it on something like the system of rice intensification. So uh, as we went into the field, I soon realized that there were some limitations to the way it was understood. Of course, there have been adaptations of the innovation systems framework. Uh, and we did four different states of India, the southern states, and we found that the way system of rice intensification was being done in Tamil Nadu was vastly different from the way it was being done in Andhra Pradesh or in, uh, you know, in, in Karnataka and so on. Uh, and there's so much plurality that one system of innovation didn't seem to make sense. Second, also, that so it made more sense to talk of systems of innovation than an innovation system, whether it was a national, local, or regional. The second was that there was so much conflict and so much mess and complexity which weren't easily captured by a normal understanding of an innovation system. Uh, so basically, the, what a, the point I'm driving is that the field was actually pushing the theory in a different way. I didn't have the right kind of theory. But let me give you another example. About a year back, and I don't recollect the exact details, uh, I think this partly relates to the very nice presentation that Adrian had made this morning. Uh, we, I had received a paper for a review on you know, bio, biomass and bioenergy uh, in a very good international journal looking at sustainable transitions. Now, the framework was very clear. They were to, wanting to look at what is known as strategic niche management. Uh, and the case was essentially about the work in Astra, and a detailed field work was done. And the, f the field, in some sense, was being you know, translated into the category of strategic niche management. And as I was doing the review, I felt deeply dis uncomfortable with the way uh, it was being theorized. And the question that I had, which I passed to the reviewers, was this. Would the people in Astra who were involved in the innovation, whether it failed or not failed, would they have categorized it in the same manner? <clears throat> and I think that that question of how do we categorize our own ideas in the field is coming back to us very, very strongly. Again, just take this idea. I think in the last two, two, two and a half days, we've not heard this word jugad. Uh, and Pankaj and I have been having some discussion on this. One view of jugad is to say the National Innovation Council take jugad and make it into frugal engineering or frugal innovation. Or in some sense, if I read Rishi Krishna Krishna's art argument, it's like from jugad to systematic innovation. Now, there's something wrong with jugad and we need to move towards what is known as a systematic innovation. Do we have a theory of Jugaad? Not quite. Anand Girdari Ras argues for the case for it, but we really need to work this out much better. Is Jugaad applicable across the country? Probably not. Does Jugaad happen in Indian scientific laboratories? Yes, it does happen, but we don't speak of it often. Now, what do we do with these kinds of categories that are coming from the field? The third example I'd like to give is, again, from a point of view of a move from 
uh, something that happened yesterday evening. When you're talking of innovation, we are talking of development. Now we're talking also of entrepreneurship. And we saw some examples from Raghunandan's story yesterday and also from Chanakya's uh, cases, etc., or Sopecom's story. Uh, when we talk of entrepreneurship or social enterprises, now I've been doing you know, flirting around with this concept called social entrepreneurship, and I teach this to our students. And we go to these conferences, and, you know, there's a huge, uh, you know, enthusiasm and hype about all of this. And Joseph Satish, my student, is here. He's now with KSCS. And we, we were doing a mapping of the social entrepreneurship space. Now, these are not formal spaces, informal spaces. A big network like the Ashoka Network, uh, which claims that, I mean, if you look at the Ashoka network of social entrepreneurs, more, I mean, a substantial number comes from India. And we map the story of the social entrepreneurs across. And it follows exactly the same pattern of, you know, what uh, Professor Narayana was speaking about, maybe a huge concentration in the South and the West, and the Naxal corridor and all those things that we are all part of, just completely ignored. Probably three social entrepreneurs from Orissa, and, you know, uh, very few from Northeast and so on. And then the policy angle to it is, you know, for these places, it is MSME, which is important, you know. And I think uh, Keshav was speaking a little bit about it. Uh, what's happening in this debate is already the social entrepreneurship space is being pushed in a particular kind of direction. If you look at the current literature on social entrepreneurship, India is, a, you know, in, in some sense, labo a laboratory for the Western academics and Western people to come and say that these are the theories. And it's being pushed so vigorously, saying that the social business is the only way forward. The Indian School of Business will create a center, have an annual con conference on social entrepreneurship, and you know, push a certain kind of model. Many of the things that we heard yesterday or today, or much in this conference, will not actually figure in this whole thing. So this issue of how do we actually, you know, create these theories which are grounded in our reality. If, if indeed India is having this large number of social entrepreneurs, what are their own senses of social enterprise? Why are we not speaking of it? Why is it that they don't speak of themselves as social entrepreneurs? They might have a different kind of category. What are those categories? And I think, I'm not saying I have the answers for this, but I think this inquiry needs to be pushed much further. So I think the arg argument I'm trying to make is that when we talk of innovations in grassroots innovations, we probably have a reasonable theorizing of the grassroots innovation of the Anil Gupta kind. And I think he's done a remarkable job on that. But we also know that if you take the model across in different places, there are variants to it. And we don't have enough understandings of these variants and what kinds of theories that can come out of these variants. And I think there's a huge amount of job that needs to be done in this space. Uh, I'd like to just briefly touch upon what I would think is the next concern that I have is about the need for grounded policy. Uh, maybe here I'd like to introduce something on, uh, <clears throat> on the work on the system of rice intensification. I mean, system of rice intensification today can be called a grassroots innovation with a totally different kind of connotation. It focuses on the fact that you need to look at things below the, uh, the ground, that there is a revolution happening on, in, 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 in roots, and roots contribute a lot. The, the plants that grow through the principles of the system of rice intensification have stronger roots and so on. Now, it's, what started off with rice is now spreading so rapidly into the same principles being used in wheat. It's now being called by different names in different places. It's being called system of root intensification, sort of rice intensification, or crop intensification, and so on. But one of the things that we all found is that as, yes, there is a role for academics here. Our work on understanding the, the structure across and being nimble enough to try and make changes. For example, and I'll give just one or two small examples and end. One was this thing that we probably got all these actors, had a national symposium in Hyderabad in 2006. And then we found that there was a huge emphasis on irrigated areas. And during that conference, we found that also that there was one actor from Tripura doing it totally differently with a huge amount of scale um, you know, in rain-fed areas and different kinds of conditions. When we visited Tripura, we decided that the best way forward is actually, to, can we make the shift from this big university to some place which has never ever held a, you, you know, a, a conference of this kind. So we moved the second national conference to Tripura. 
And I think then we brought a certain kind of focus. So this nimbleness that is required for policy is often missing in, in the discourse. Last night, we were trying to analyze the data that we have. The SRI India community is now quite large. There is an e-group, which has about 400 odd members. And it seems to represent a new kind of commons. So when we were part of this consultative process, the planning commission, we said, let's try and get opinions from people. And last night, when we were analyzing it, we realized that one of the things we found was that the, here are people with, you know, we asked them how many years you know SRI about. And they say many of them, actually, a predominant number said we've been doing this for the last five years. And if you look at the government working on it, or the researchers who are doing work on it, many of them are less than two years, three years, et cetera. Now, these people are writing the policy, and these people who have the experience are in quite part of the policy discussions and debates. Now, I, the, the question again is, how do we again root some of this groundedness in policy, which is otherwise, you know, we are now having a difficulty, another subgroup saying SRI works only in irrigated areas. Now we are having to gather evidence to say rainfed areas, SRI is extremely important, it can work. You don't need to have assured irrigation. There is such large evidence and scale that you need to consider that has to happen. So I'd like to just submit that we need to again get back to issues on grounded theory and policy. Thank you. <laughs>